Hi everyone and welcome to a lecture that I've put together that focuses on the urinary tract system and looks mostly at basic embryology, anatomy, and physiology. So like I said, we'll be looking at the embryology, anatomy, and physiology, and we'll even take a look at some lab values that are relevant when it comes to doing ultrasound of the renal. Some useful chapters for you guys to read if you find this lecture really overwhelming or you need a refresher is chapter 8 from Introduction um, to Normal Structure and Function. There you'll be able to read a lot about normal physiology of the kidneys. Chapter 13 from Before We Are Born for, focuses on the embryology of the um, kidneys. Chapter 15 is really focused on the ultrasound appearance of the kidney tract um, and then you have the Imaging Referencing Center, which you can access through the library, and there you are able to look up different pathologies, and you can look at how they look on ultrasound. They usually provide you with a few different case studies. They also provide you with information such as uh, patient presentation and what the gold standard testing is, what treatment options are, clinical history, um, things like that. If you have not already stumbled upon the Khan Academy on YouTube, I love their page and I really think that they provide a lot of great information. Some of their videos are a bit longer, but I don't think there's many that are over that 20 or 30 minute mark. So if you find that certain things are really confusing or you need someone to clarify, try uh, looking through the Khan Academy and seeing if they have anything that would be helpful for you. We'll dive straight on into embryology. So when we talk about the development of the kidneys, we are talking about the development of the genital system as well because they develop pretty closely together. So it's why when there's an anomaly in one system, it's really common for there to be an anomaly in the other. Uh, this lecture is going to focus mostly on the kidneys. So we have three stages of development or three different sets of kidneys that develop during the life of an embryo and a fetus. The first one to develop is the pronephros, which appears early in the fourth week of gestation, and it develops quite high in the embryo, kind of in that neck region. There's also a duct, which is called the pronephric duct, and it runs from the pronephros to the cloaca. The first thing that I want you to take home about the pronephros is that it is rudimentary and it is non-functioning. That means it does not produce any urine, it does not do any filtration. The second thing that I want to kind of drive home here is what the cloaca is. So the cloaca is actually this early embryological structure that develops as part of the early gut formation, and it is at the closed end of the tube. So later on in development, the cloaca is going to turn into or develop into the rectum, the bladder, and the early development of the genitals. Um, after we have the pronephros that develops, like I said, in that early fourth week, at the end of that fourth week, we'll actually get the development of the mesonephros, which develops slightly inferior to the pronephros. And what is really cool is that the mesonephros is actually going to start to create and excrete urine. So it's going to take over and actually work from about week four, the end of week four, um, till about week 10 until the adult kidneys are um, kind of doing their thing. And so that uh, pronephric duct um, is now going to become the mesonephric duct. So the mesonephric duct is going to go from the mesonephros down to the cloaca. Um, and like I said, it's going to be creating urine until about the end of the 10th week. And then it's going to start to degenerate towards the end of the first trimester. Our final stage of development of the kidney is the development of the metanephros. That begins to develop as early as the fifth week of gestation. And it's going to start to function at about nine weeks. These, or this structure, is going to be what develops into our adult kidneys and excretes urine. And in um, a fetus's life, it's going to be um, that urine that is excreted into the amniotic cavity and helps form a portion of the amniotic fluid. 
So right now we're going to kind of look a little bit more into de the development of the metanephros, which is that adult kidney. So the, um, the adult kidney or the metanephros develops from two different structures, which is the ureteric bud and the metanephrogenic blastema. The ureteric bud is almost like a mass that grows from the mesonephric duct and it develops really, really close to the cloaca. So I want you to think about where the cloaca is, which is really low because it's the end of our gut. And beside it, we have that mesonephric duct, which was going from the mesonephros, which was that rudimentary kidney, um, that second one, all the way down into the cloaca. And so right beside those mesonephric ducts, we have masses, and the mass is called the ureteric bud. That's all clear. So the mesonephric bud is going to develop into the ureter, the renal pelvis, the calyces, and the collecting tubules of our adult kidney. So this bud is slowly going to start to elongate, and it's going to develop, and it's going to develop all of those different areas that I talked about. And it's actually going to penetrate into the metanephrogenic blastema. And the nephrogenic blastema is this mass of cells that's eventually going to form the nephron. The stalk of the ureteric bud is going to become the ureter. So the stalk, like think about a bean stalk, that lengthy little bit, is going to become the ureter. And the superior part is going to branch multiple times. And it's these branches that are going to develop into the collecting tubules of the kidneys and help create the major and the minor calyces and develop into different parts of the nephron. As development continues for the metanephros, it's going to start from being really low in the pelvis to slowly moving its way up into the abdomen. And that's more or less going to be a result of the um, embryo growing. So like I said, it's going to start really low and it's going to start to migrate up. It reaches the adult position, which is um, in the abdomen um, by about nine weeks. As those kidneys are ascending, they're also going to be rotating medially to sit in the body the way we know they do. The blood supply from the kidneys is also going to change as they ascend. So the initial blood supply when they first start to develop really low in the pelvis is going to be from branches that come off of the common iliac arteries. As they ascend, um, the blood supply is going to change from the common iliac arteries to the distal aorta. And then as they ascend some more, it's finally going to be from the abdominal aorta. And then those branches are going to be known as the renal arteries. As those kidneys are moving superiorly and the blood supply is changing, the original branches that were feeding that kidney are just going to degenerate and be reabsorbed. Um, the kidney is really important in maintaining balance in our body or homeostasis. Um, it's really important that we know the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And so the kidney is able to maintain homeostasis by regulating pH levels of our blood, um, by reabsorbing or by um, excreting bicarbonate. The kidneys help regulate our blood pressure by modifying how much water stays in versus how much it, um, water is excreted out of our blood. And they help get metabolic rate waste um, with the production of urine. I'm not going to go into fine details of how uh, the nephron works, but if you, again, like I said at the beginning, if you're unsure, not familiar, go ahead and read um, that chapter from Curry and Tumpkin because it does a really good job and provides some great diagrams as to how the uh, kidney works. The kidneys are found in the retroperitoneal cavity and the right kidney tends to sit lower than the left. I'm not going to tell you why, but I want you to think about why and see if you can come up with an, uh, with an answer. Some of you may already know. Some of you might be like sitting there thinking really hard as to why. If you cannot come up with an answer, post in the discussion board and see if someone else knows. There's no such thing as a stupid question and we're all here to learn together. 
once someone tells you, you're going to be like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Um, the kidneys also have a capsule around them, which we can see on ultrasound really, really nicely. The adult kidney tends to be between 9 to 12 centimeters, and they can vary in size between side to side, um, but there's usually not a discrepancy that's greater than 2 centimeters, and if there is, it's usually indicative of some kind of pathology or an anomaly, and we need to know why, why they are so different. Uh, and then we can actually break the kidney up into different parts. So we have the renal parenchyma and the renal sinus. And then we can break the renal parenchyma into two other parts, which is the renal medulla and the renal cortex. The renal medulla is the inner part of the kidney and is responsible for absorption and is made up of the renal pyramids. The renal cortex is that outside part of the kidney and it's responsible for filtration of the blood and that is what contains the glomeruli of the nephron. The renal sinus is what contains the collecting system and would include the minor and the major calyces along with the renal pelvis. So now we'll take a quick look at the renal arterial blood supply. So we have our renal artery which comes off of the abdominal aorta just inferior to the superior mesenteric artery and as soon as it enters into the kidney, it starts to branch. And our first branch is going to be the segmental artery, and then it's going to be the interlobar artery, and the interlobar arteries can be seen going between the pyramids. And then that branches into the arcuate arteries, and the arcuate arteries branch at the base of the pyramids into the interlobular arteries, which branch even smaller into our afferent arterioles. The afferent arterioles are then going to carry the blood into the glomerulus for filtration, and before it can go back into our venous system, it's going to come back through the efferent arterioles and then make its way into the interlobular veins, then to the arcuate vein, the interlobar vein, the segmental vein, and finally the renal vein, which then drains into the IVC. So now let's take a look at some of the lab values we may look at for the kidneys. Of course, before you take any patient in, there's a list of things that we're going to do, which is looking at our lab values and also looking at um, previous imaging. Um, but for right now, we're just going to focus on the importance of lab values for the kidneys. If you can gain access to your place of practice to the patient's lab values, um, you should really be looking at them. It can really help change what you think something is on ultrasound based on the lab values. It may also make you a little more aware of subtle changes that are occurring in a patient's body. Um, for example, if you had a patient who had blood in their urine, then you would know it would be extremely important that you have a patient with an optimally distended bladder so that you can evaluate the contours of that bladder and ensure that there is no other pathology within it, such as stones or sludge or a subtle mass. When we look at lab values for the renal system, um, some of the specific things we may look for is the urinalysis, which can show the presence of blood or bacteria or pus. Um, and then we would also be looking at our blood work, which can demonstrate how well the kidneys are or are not functioning. Another thing we might be looking for when evaluating our blood work is for any increase in inflammatory markers to know if there's any chance of any infection or inflammation somewhere in the patient's body. Um, when we look at the blood urea nitrogen or BUN levels, it's a measure of the urea nitrogen that is present in the blood. And that is actually a byproduct of protein metabolism, and it gets excreted by the kidney. So if it's not being excreted by the kidney, then it means that there's something going on. The kidney isn't able to do its job properly. It's pretty similar for creatinine, where creatinine is a waste product, which is excreted by the kidneys. And if we have increased creatinine, then it is an indication of some form of renal disease. The glomerulus Glomerular filtration rate actually takes into account the creatinine levels, age, body size, and the gender of the patient to evaluate the overall function of the kidney. And then we have the LDL levels or lactate dehydrogenase, 
which is an enzyme that if found in the blood, um, or when it's found in the blood, can be used to monitor renal function. It's also really important that we understand that almost all of our tissues actually have uh, LDL in them, and LDL gets raised when um, there is cell death. So if this value is raised, it's not specific to the kidneys and they probably need a further investigation as to what's going on, but we would take a look and it would be something that we're kind of trying to monitor while we're doing scan. That is everything for today's uh, PowerPoint. I hope you found this helpful. And again, if you need some clarification on things, just post in the discussion board and I'll be happy to reply. Have a great weekend.